Today we are continuing part two of a three-part lesson on probably the most important question that we can ask, what must I do to be saved? And sadly, that question is often answered in the wrong way, and that is the sad part that we want to try to overcome with these, the truth that is revealed in the New Testament about the gospel. We looked at the last lesson regarding how did we become lost, which many wrongly teach that we are born <clears throat> guilty of Adam's sin that has been inherited at birth, but the scriptures teach that sin is the violation of God's law, failing to do what is right in the sight of God, and we do that when we reach that age where we distinguish between right and wrong, and we do that which is wrong in the sight of God. We are not born guilty of sin. We are born God creating us in his own image and giving us the nature that is according to his own image, but that nature is corrupted when we choose uh, to commit our own sins, and for those sins we are guilty before God. But then we looked at the fact that how, how has, what has God done to save us? God has sent Jesus because he loved us and because he uh, is a just God and desired that sin should be punished, but that the sinner should be saved, being a merciful, loving God. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, punishing sin and providing a way for the sinner to be saved through Jesus. He raised Jesus from the dead on the third day and exalted him in heaven at his right hand as king and high priest. And therefore God has done this so that we might be saved from our sins. He has revealed in the New Testament, the gospel, what he has done to save us and what we must do to be saved. And he has confirmed that word that was given to the apostles and other inspired men. He has confirmed that word by miracle, guiding those men into what they should say and write confirming that word by miracle so that we might be able to receive and understand and then understanding obey that gospel in order to be saved. And now we come to some wrong answers regarding how we are to be saved. And it is a shame because our soul salvation depends on getting the right answer to this question, but so many times we're given the wrong answer. Many people uh, regarding the, when they're asked the question regarding uh, what, my, what we must do to be saved, they are told to do nothing in regard to being saved because God will save everybody. Just don't worry about doing anything because God will save everybody. It doesn't make any difference what we do. Uh, but when we read the scripture, when we look at a passage like Romans 1 and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we must uh, obey the gospel. We must believe and obey the gospel in order to be saved. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so not everyone will be saved, those who do not obey the gospel, 
they are going to be condemned and those who obey the gospel are going to be saved. So not, uh, it is impossible to believe that all people, regardless, will be saved. That is not what the Word of God teaches. In Mark 16, in verse 15 and 16, Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, said, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so not everyone who believes is going to be saved, but those who believe and are baptized, and later uh, in this lesson, especially next week, the Lord willing, in the third part of this lesson, we will point out that we must be baptized, immersed in water in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins. Baptism is an act of faith that God is determined, that God has commanded that we must do in order to become a, a, a Christian, in order to be brought into relationship with God through Jesus. If we do not do that, then we have not become children of God. We, we are not saved we will not be saved. Acts 2 and verse 40, the first preaching of the gospel, which we will get into in the last part of this lesson today. Acts 2 and verse 40, the apostle uh, said, and with many other words, uh, Peter, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And so there was something that they must do, that is, obey the gospel in order to be saved so not all people will be saved. Then some people say that we are to just live a good moral life and do the best we can, and uh, then that is the way we will be saved. Certainly Cornelius the centurion, centurion in Caesarea would be a wonderful example of one who lived a wonderful moral life, even eclipsing uh, many around him who claimed to serve God. Acts 10 and verse 1, Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he, cleared, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Well, what did the angel communicate to Cornelius, this good moral man who was seeking to serve God, at least as far as he knew to serve him. Well, Peter, recounting what part of the angel said to Cornelius in Acts chapter 11 and verse 14, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So this angel said there's something indispensable that needs to be communicated to you, Cornelius, so that you and your household will be saved. In other words, your good moral, good, good moral life has been uh, remembered by God, but it does not save you. There's something that you must do beyond what you have, what you are doing, if you are going to be saved. That is, you must believe and obey the gospel of Christ. 
And then some people uh, teach that we need to be good and we need to exalt nature, glorify and exalt nature. The problem with that is that instead of exalting nature or admiring nature, we exalt it and it becomes our idol instead of God. And that is what is happening to so many today who believe that we can be saved, w w that we, we should rather save the earth instead of save our souls. And they have made the earth an idol. And the ones who tell us that we need to save the earth uh, by following their dictates are actually destroying the earth because they, are, they have detached themselves from God and they are glorifying their own destructive purposes instead of, uh, instead of glorifying the one who uh, will, will help us in saving our souls and also respecting the earth in a, in a balanced, uh, in a way that will uh, protect the earth but will not uh, idolize the earth. Romans 1 and verse 21, this is what happened to the Gentiles uh, that we will read about when we study our classes on Romans, begin that study in a few weeks, the Lord willing. Romans 1 and verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That is, they became uh, morons, mentally speaking. They became fools, detaching themselves from the Creator, uh, from the only one who presents truth to humanity, that is God, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust, lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Talking about homosexuality and all the evil that people do with their bodies and even fornication outside of marriage. Verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the cre creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So a lot of people believe they can be saved by honoring, honoring and exalting nature. And what happens is they make nature an idol and they become worse than animals in their behavior because they didn't detach themselves from the only moral authority in the universe, the one who created it, God himself. So that is not the way of salvation either. And then people believe that we just can believe and accept Jesus as Lord, maybe praying the sinner's prayer or doing something, accept him as Lord and Savior in our hearts, but not really be concerned about any uh, type of obedience, especially in being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That has nothing to do, they say, with being saved. But when we read in James chapter 2 and verse 21 what it means to have a saving faith in Jesus, it is to be a faith that works, that obey, obeys God, not a faith that tries to figure out how not to obey God. James chapter 2 and verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered up Isaac his son on the altar, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected or completed. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was 
reckoned to him as righteousness or for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And so back in Genesis 15 and verse 6, this is a scripture was fulfilled when Abraham's faith was an obedient faith in God and he offered Isaac on the altar, altar trusting God to uh, bring Isaac back from the dead if that's what God had him do to kill his son God would provide a way that his son would still live and that the promise that God made through Isaac about making Abraham a great nation and that nation inheriting a land, the land in which Abraham was living, the land of Canaan, would be fulfilled. That was an obedient working faith, not a faith that just said, oh, I believe God's promise. No, that, that scripture was fulfilled in the obedient faith of Abraham to carry out the command of God to kill his son upon the altar. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That should settle the whole argument. We cannot be justified by faith alone. It must be an obedient faith to whatever the conditions God has given to save us. Verse 25, in the same way was not Rahab, the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Faith that does not obey, that tries to find a way not to obey God, is a dead faith. It cannot, it will not, it will never save us from our sins. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So our friends that tell us that the sinner's prayer will save us are not telling us the truth. They are confused. They are misled. Uh, we are saved when we believe in Jesus enough to repent of our sins, to confess him as the Son of God, and to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. At that point, we become children of God by the grace of God through faith, through the death of Jesus, by his resurrection. We become children of God and we are come, come up out of the water, new creatures, God forgiving us of all of our sins through our obedient faith, trusting in his grace through Jesus' death to forgive us, being raised up to a new life as Jesus was raised from the grave, no longer uh, to be... Uh, no longer to be subject to death again, but to be subject to the will of God. Then we say, then we see that people say that we should just follow our own religious belief as long as we are sincere. Just join whatever church you want or do whatever you do, but that will not work either to save us. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Did we not do all of these wonderful things in your name? And then will come the answer, verse 23. The sad answer will come back. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
I don't know who you people are, the Lord will say. I never had a relationship with you, even though you claim to do many things in my name. What a shocking thing that will be said. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or iniquity or sin. In other words, you tried to partially obey God, reject what you didn't like, what you didn't understand, or what you didn't want to do, and then do the things that you wanted to do and claim that would be acceptable in the sight of God. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart into that eternal punishment because you have practiced sin and not did what was right in the sight of God. We don't want to be in that position. We don't want to be partially obedient to God, rejecting those things because we are told that they are not the will of God when the Word of God plainly says that they are the will of God, such as baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. It was the Apostle Paul who rejected the gospel call and held to the traditions of the Pharisees but in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, he said, Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. But he discovered that he was living wrongly before God on the road to Damascus, Jesus appearing to him, blinding him by miracle, and telling him, go into Damascus, and it will be told you, told to you what you must do to be saved. That puts a lie to another idea that is common, that people say that Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. He was not. He was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, blinded by miracle and then humbled before Jesus, but then he was told that God would send somebody to him, that is, Ananias, who would tell him what he must do in order to be saved. He was not saved on the road to Damascus. That was the beginning, but it was not where he was saved. He was saved in Damascus, when he was baptized to wash away his sins, as Ananias called upon him to do in Acts 22 and verse 16. So now we look at the fact that these, there can be many wrong answers. Uh, there are others that we did not cover, but we will begin to cover the right answer in this lesson today. What must we do to be saved? And we would encourage you, to look into the Word of God. Look into the Word of God and see what the answer is to that question and follow it based upon the Word of God rather than the wrong answers that pervert the Word of God. That question, what must I do to be saved, is Ask in Acts 2 and verse 37, first preaching of the gospel. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do to be saved? Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, on the road to Damascus, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That is Paul. Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, then the Lord said to him, Arise, and go into the city, and you will be told what you must, not what you optionally must do, what you must do. That is the new King James Version that we have listed uh, there. And then Acts 16 and verse 30, the Philippian jailer, after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so we want to look at the answer 
to that question, and we begin like this. I must hear the gospel, the good news of Christ. In order to believe in Jesus, I must hear about Jesus, about what he has done, dying on the cross that we might be saved, being raised from the dead by the power of God on the third day, appearing to his disciples, and then ascending back into heaven where God exalted him as Lord and high priest. I must hear that message if I'm going to believe it. Acts 10, Romans 10, verse 13, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean? We'll get to that in the coming lesson. How then will they call on him in whom they have, have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Then he goes on in verse 15. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all hear they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah says Lord who has believed our re uh, our report so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ so in this case, they would be sent those, the apostles and others, so that they could hear, so that they could believe in Jesus, and so that they could know what it means to call upon his name. And that is what happened when we read in the book of Acts. We have a partial history of the spread of the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles by those men who were guided by the Holy Spirit to preach the truth so that they might call upon his name. And that is what we read about, and that is what happened. And today we can even read this for ourselves so that faith can be produced in Jesus, so that we can obey the gospel in order to be saved. We must hear that message either by somebody speaking to us or us reading it directly ourselves. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles. They began speaking in known human languages, not unknown heavenly languages, but known human languages that their compatriots had grown up learning in various parts of the Roman Empire. And they explained in the first preaching of the gospel that this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2, hundreds of years earlier, that there would be a pouring out of the power of the Holy Spirit upon men, that they would speak in languages that were, were unknown to them, the ones speaking, but known to the ones hearing, the human languages that thereby confirming that, that Jesus was reigning in heaven over heaven and earth and that this was the gospel message of salvation that were, was being brought to the Jews and eventually to the Gentiles on about how, what we must do to be saved, about the Lord Jesus and what he had done and what God had done to raise him from the dead and exalt him at, at his right hand, giving him all authority over heaven and earth, Acts 2 and verse 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. He continues on, Even on my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 
and I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord will, Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then they begin telling them they can't call on the name of the Lord unless they are told about the Lord. Unless they can believe in the Lord, how will they call upon his name? Well, they began speaking about the Lord. What, how has Jesus been made Lord? Well, Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Jesus came to earth, grew up in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem of a virgin, that is Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, providing his physical body, God coming to earth, being born in Bethlehem as was prophesied, growing up in Nazareth, performing miracles, even raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, making the crippled walk. All of them knew something about Jesus, that yes, he was a man of great miracles, not just speaking about what he said about the word of God, but confirming it by miracles. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This man who confirmed that he was the Son of God by miracles, that he was God's anointed one, the Messiah, you put him to death because you rejected him. You did not want to have any part of him. You believed that he was a blasphemer, although the evidence was right in front of you that he is the Son of God. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. It was prophesied that Jesus would die on the cross, Isaiah 53, and other passages. It was prophesied that Jesus would be raised from the dead, Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, I believe. That is quoted in Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, for David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Well, why is that? because you will not allow or abandon your soul, abandon my soul to Hades, to the realm of the grave, the unseen, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So we have Jesus foretold in the 16th Psalm that he would not undergo decay, that his body would not turn to dust, and that he would not be 
continuing in Hades, like all of us will. If we die before Jesus comes, we remain in that realm of the dead, Hades, until Jesus comes again, either being in paradise or torment, depending on how we have responded to the gospel in this life. Jesus would not remain in Hades, and Jesus' body would not suffer decay. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 16. Then he says in verse 29, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to, to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, and that is in Acts 7 and also uh, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and uh, Psalm 100. 132, as well as other places, God sworn to David with an oath that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne and the kingdom would continue forever. Verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. That is, David was not talking about himself in the 16th Psalm or any other person except Jesus. And Jesus, on the third day, God raised him from the, from the dead, fulfilling the 16th Psalm. This Jesus, verse 32, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And for 40 days he appeared to those men, as well as others, ate and drank with them and talked with them, let them touch the wounds that had been inflicted upon his body in the crucifixion. Verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth out this which you both see and hear them speaking in those languages they had not learned, but that the people could understand their fellow Jews from different parts of the Roman Empire. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Set at my right hand, set at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Again, David prophesying in the 110th Psalm that Jesus would not remain in the grave. His body would not decay. 16th Psalm, he would be raised from the dead and exalted at the right hand of God as priest and king, as high priest and king, the 110th Psalm. Uh, quoted by Peter here, guided by the Holy Spirit, that it was all in God's plan that those who rejected Jesus would never be able to defeat him, but God, out of his love and out of his justice for punishing sin and his love for the sinner, sent Jesus to die for our sins. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, giving him all authority over heaven and earth, and now the question is, what are you going to do about it? You rejected him, you either agreed with the crucifixion or agreed with those who uh, were uh, involved in it, you rejected him, but God is sent him to die for our sins and has exalted him at his right hand after raising him from the dead. Now what are you going to do about it? So that is where we must leave this lesson today regarding what we must do to be saved. Uh, what are we going to do about it? 
Uh, we are going to hear about this Jesus, and then we are going to have to make a decision. We are going to have to make a decision as to what we must do to be saved. We must first hear that message, and if you have heard about Jesus even before or even today, then the scriptures that we will mention in the last part of this lesson the next time, but we summarize it here today. If you believe, if you would become a Christian today, if you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that God did raise him from the dead after sending him to die for our sins, and he's ruling in heaven, having all authority over heaven and earth, then believe in that Jesus to the point of repenting of your sins and be confess that name of Jesus before men per Acts chapter 8 as we will read about later in next week's lesson repent of your sins in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 after they cried out what shall we do then Peter says repent of your sins and each of you be baptized immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins upon your confession of Jesus as the Son of God that we read in Acts chapter 8. And be baptized, immersed in water by his authority in, the, in his name that you may be forgiven of all your past sins. If you are willing to do that, then you can become a child of God today. And we would encourage you to do that before it is ever too late. Not those wrong ways that we studied uh, about how to be saved, but just that, believing, repenting, confessing our, our belief in Jesus as the Son of God before men and being baptized as soon as possible to be united with Christ by faith through the blood that cleanses us, raised up, in the likeness of his resurrection out of the water of baptism that we might begin to walk in newness of life committed to him guided by the apostles teaching and that only and as we continue to live the Christian life as we fall short of his will which we do from time to time then as fallen Christians repent and pray confessing our sins that the blood of Jesus might continue to cleanse us as we read about in Acts chapter 8, verse 22, and other places, continue to repent and pray, confessing our sins, that we may be able to continue to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. If you are subject to that gospel invitation, we would encourage all to respond. Before it is ever too late, as we now today draw our important lesson from the scriptures to a close.